folks, let me introduce you to a friend of mine, and and uh, for, and I think a friend of several of us possibly here. I'm uh, I'm I'm really pleased that Mr. Johnny Boggs is here for us. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, Johnny's a nine-time winner of the Spur Award uh, from Western Writers of America. That's the uh, premier or organization in support of writers of the Western genre, and uh, so uh, there's no higher esteem as a writer that you can have it than to win a spur and for him to have won it nine times i think says it all but uh but uh two other things johnny and i share one thing now he did it a little longer than i did he did it a lot longer than i did but we're both ex-sports writers <laughs> we both wrote sports at a newspaper and i just think that is so cool and it just it just lets you know the breadth of his uh background and he's the current editor of the managing editor, I might add, of, of the magazine, The Roundup, which is the magazine in support of Western Writers of America. So uh, Johnny has a, a breadth of, of experience and knowledge, and he's a fun guy. And I'm going to shut up, turn it over to Mr. Johnny Boggs. Well, that's the kind of dialogue I like, Joe. Why don't you just keep on talking, and uh, I'll, I'll just listen. Am I coming in loud and clear? Yes, you are. You're okay. doing great. Yes, you are, Johnny. You're, you're, you're perfect. All right. Well, the idea here is to talk about dialogue and dialogue and, and, and novels, whatever kind of novel you're doing. I mean, it's all about communication, which is part of the dialogue process. One problem a lot of times I see with, uh, with uh, you know, even experienced writers is the idea for when you're writing a novel is from the first sentence to the last sentence, you're moving forward and trying to get the readers to stay with you all the way to the end of that book or short story or novella, whatever you're writing, even nonfiction. Uh, nonfiction, you can't make up the dialogue, by the way. But uh, dialogue is a way and a form of moving the plot about. Uh, dialogue is not to fill space uh, and dialogue has to you know, just keep keep the momentum moving forward and forward and forward. And, and the way you do that is, is totally up to you. I always say, preface everything uh, by saying, <clears throat> you, can, you can follow me to everything I say and have tremendous success. You can do everything I say and have absolutely no success. You can do it your way and have more success than I can ever imagine. You can do it your way and figured out that doesn't work so you you find joe's way and see is, is that work it's all a process and it's all a process of finding out what works for you there's no right there is no wrong way to write any anything uh you know well, yeah there's grammar and things like that you know subject verb agreements but how you do that is is totally up to you and again what one person you know one person um likes another person may not like uh and that's part of the part of the joys of being part of the frustrations of being a writer I always say though only two opinions matter your opinion and the opinion of someone who has the authority to offer you a deal and pay for your work and that's the whole process when you're a professional writer but we're talking about dialogue here so 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 how do you do dialogue? I, I work typically um, from an outline. Uh, I have the, kind of a, broken it down by how many chapters I'm gonna need to do for a book or what I need to get into the short story or whatever I'm writing. Um, and then it's all kind of you know, plotted out a little bit of where I want to be at such and such point. It's, it's a, it is a loose, loose outline. What I don't outline usually is dialogue because dialogue is all off the cuff. I mean, we're making things up, we're thinking, you got a speech that you're gonna follow, but whoever really follows a speech? And, and uh, I, was, I was doing a panel just like this about a year ago and um, uh, with Sandra Dallas out of Denver, who's a phenomenal writer and uh, just, a, just I, I can't believe how well she writes all the time. But she had a great comment and said that, and she said, we're talking about dialogue, and she says, only Barack Obama speaks in complete sentences. And we said, well, yeah, there's, there's probably a little bit of truth to that. 
so how do you do it? How do you do a dialogue? I mean, what are the ways of doing dialogue and, and how do you do it? I was thinking about first person. Now I write first person sometimes. It, it depends on if it's going to work or not. But how do you get the character to identify himself in first person? I mean, you, know, you say, we well, can start it off. My name is Joe Blow. My name is whatever. But it always seems kind of forced or something like that. So <clears throat> I always turn to, to Raymond Chandler, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite writers. Uh, and this was his first Philip, Mar Philip Marlowe book. And in there, he's meeting with this rich old guy. And the rich old guy says, tell me about yourself, Mr. Marlowe. I suppose I have the right to ask. Sure, but there's very little to tell. I'm 33 years old, went to college once and can still speak English if there's a demand, any demand for it. There isn't much in my trade. I worked for Mr. Wilde, the district attorney, as an investigator once. His chief investigator, a man named Bernie Oles, called me and told me he wanted to see me. I'm unmarried because I don't like policemen's wives. And a little bit of a cynic, the old man smiled. You didn't like working for Wilde? I was fired for insubordination. I test very high on insubordination, General. I always did myself, sir. I'm glad to hear it. What do you know more about my family? Private eye? Yeah, that's 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 how he's going to talk. He's kind of, you know, you, you get a little bit of what you need to know about Philip Marlowe right there. Get his background in one paragraph. You get everything you really need to know about where he's coming from. And you can tell by his tone that well, he's a little cynical, but that's how you do it. That's one way of doing it. There are always different ways of doing it. Uh, but then we also have a little bit of thing when we are talking about historical fiction on, on dialogue and what, what works and what doesn't work. Matt Braun was a tremendously successful Western novelist, died a few years back. Uh, <clears throat> and um, he's an Owen Wister Award winner. He was a best-selling, one of his uh, novels was uh, made into a made-for-TV movie uh, starring uh, Christopher Reeves, Superman. Uh, and he's got this little piece of dialogue here when he's when he's writing <clears throat> about him. This is a mountain man saga. And he writes this dialogue, starts out. Newell's belly bounced with rumbling laughter. Cross to mighty. I hire you to tell we had our year limbo hump mate in the pot nigh on every day and more blasted beaver than you could beat off with a club. You're looking at a rich man, youngin. Made him come, I did. Well, bragging ain't my specialty, you'll recollect, but we didn't exactly pull up empty handed our own selves. David Jackson ain't one to share a cave with, but that coon sure outshines the rest of his bunch. Brung in 23 packs we did, and nary a pelt among them won't go for prime. Which stinks. It's absolutely awful. And Matt Brown says so in this book he wrote on how to write a Western novel. He goes, the entire book, all 352 pages, contains similar dialogue. To put it as charitably as possible, I got carried away with the mountain man dialect. The reader needed a translator every time one of the characters opened his mouth. And he's right. And that's the problem sometimes when you're writing historical fiction or you're writing you know, Southern literature or whatever. I mean, you have to make the dialogue readable to the modern reader. If you're writing for kids, you've got to tone it down a little bit on that level too, depending on the age of the children or young adults. It's all about faking it is what the way I call it. I'm writing about, um, I've, I've written three novels set in the uh, Revolutionary War era South, the pre-Revolutionary War South. And I understand that if I wrote the way, if I had my characters speaking the way they actually talked in the 18th century, the reader's not gonna be able to understand what anybody's saying. You've gotta be able to fake it. You do that by different ways. One of the best ways I think in John Adams they did, uh, the miniseries John Adams, no one spoke in contractions. It was all spoken a little, a little properly, will not instead of won't, things like that. I mean, there are little ways to get through it. Throw in one word, throw in a couple of words that make it sound authentic, but it really has to be readable to everybody to get, get away with it. Characters also, um, the way of dialogue 
of works is you identify a character by the way the character speaks. Drops the G's, speaks in the twang, stuff like that, speaks with a German accent. Uh, what you often don't want to do, what people sometimes overuse is write in dialect. A little bit of dialect goes a long way. It's like, you know, too much salt uh, spoils the meal. So you have to be careful on things like that, uh, dialogue on things like that. Another great piece of dialogue I always really liked, um, um, The Big Heat was made to a fairly successful Glenn Ford uh, film noir in the 1950s, written by a, a crime novelist I've always really admired. Doesn't get as much attention as, as Raymond Chandler, uh, uh, Tony Hillerman, plays people like that. Uh, but The Big Heat by William P. McGilvern. We have a scene here where, where a, a cop whose wife was killed in a bomb explosion meant for him comes up to a uh, a woman, and it turns out the woman has been, um, where her husband was a crooked cop who left a suicide note expelling, uh, explaining every all the crooks in the city. She took the note and let the mobsters know that she has the note. And if something happens to her, that the note will be released to the police and then all the mobsters will be facing some serious stiff penalties. So the detective whose wife was killed comes in and says, you're lying. You're delighted at what happened to her. You have a horrid mind, she said, smiling up at him, her eyes wide and bright. Poor Lucy, what a ghastly finish to her shabby little life. You wouldn't have it any other way, Banyan said. She smiled ruefully as if caught in a small deceit. You're right, I believe. I save the newspaper stories about it and rereading them satisfies something deep inside me, Mr. Banyan. Something not very nice, I'm afraid, but then I'm not a nice person. I'm glad she got paid off fittingly. You're also glad that your husband blew his brains out, Banyan said, and you were glad to find the note, the note he left to make amends for what he had done. You denied him that chance, again, quite happily, I'm sure. Oh, Tom was a fool, Mrs. Deary said, shrugging. I have no sympathy with deathbed confessions. He was no angel. He was smart. He made enough for us to live decently at first. He had his soul struggles about it and finally decided to live on a salary. He never cared about me, of course. He, he didn't care that I had no clothes, no jewels, none of the things a woman might expect out of life. It was after his affair with Lucy Carraway that he turned over a new leaf and isn't that a ridiculous development, by the way? Imagine anyone seeing the light through an association with that trap. At any rate, like all men who've been tied to their mother's knee, he suddenly turned back to religion when he lost his nerve. Oh, he got very religious and saintly, Mr. Banyan. He spent eight years worrying about his sins, and finally he decided to absolve himself by telling all in a note and blowing his brains out. She smiled contemptuously. Fortunately, I got the note instead of the papers. And you'll hang on to it, Banyan said slowly. A whole city is dying at the end of a gang of thieves, but you don't care a bit. You'll protect Stone and Lagania. You'll save murderers from the chair. You'll let justice be kicked into an alley just for the sake of a mink coat and a diamond brooch. Mrs. Dreary laughed softly and wet her lips with the tip of her small pink tongue. Go on, Mr. Banyan. You're really amusing, she said. And you'll cheat your husband out of his last chance to have ease his conscience, Banyan said in the same slow, hard voice. Yes, 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 Mrs. Deary said, snapping the words out fiercely. I've suffered and now it's over. I'm going to empty life, enjoy life to the hilt now, and none of your dreary moralization affects me in the least. You think the coming years are going to be good? She seemed amused at the question. Certainly I do. You're wrong. There'll be wonderful years, Mrs. Dreary, Deary said and began to laugh. There aren't going to be any years at all, Banyan said slowly. What do you mean? Banyan's face was hard and gray as he took the gun from his shoulder holster. Can't you guess, Mrs. Deary? You won't do it. The note will be delivered then, Banyan said. 
the note with the papers present. That's the big heat, bright lady, for Lagania Stone, for the rest of our city's thieving bastards. So she underestimates him. You get what you need to know about her. Know about her and that, you know, she's just a, a man wrote this novel, by the way, but she's just the, uh, the evil woman. And you get to know what about him that he's willing to kill her to get revenge and to see justice done. Dialogue always works. Dialogue comes, can work. Dialogue has to move the plot. The one trick that you see here and other tricks here and there is when you have a long conversation of dialogue, you want to break it up a little bit. Let people remember who's talking let remember, and have them doing something else. If he's on a telephone phone call, say he's in a, back when there were uh, phone booths, you know, he can glance at, he glanced at his watch or a truck rolled by. He had to pause to let uh, a woman um, push in her stroller past, things like that, just to break it up a little bit so it's not a string and string of dialogue. I always say one of the best things to do when you're learning writing or, or even learning plotting is to look at a screenplay of a movie that you happen to like, uh, or a good movie with good dialogue maybe, but uh, because a screenplay gets, gets rid of all the stuff that we used to fill in the story. A screenplay is dialogue and it's plot. And you can follow that. You can follow uh, stuff like that. You know, uh, Elmer Leonard, a great crime novelist and Western novelist before that, uh, was a master at dialogue. You find some of the screenplays that were adapted for his books, um, especially some of the renowned Westerns, uh, Randall Scott, directed by Bud Pettiker, uh, written usually by Bud Burt Kennedy. Leonard's one of the few writers who could just nail a person's motivation in like one or two sentences. Uh, and that's a gift that most of us never really have. Uh, I'm going to share with you just one more little piece here. Uh, and this, um, so it's a chapter from a novel I did that was published a few years ago. I actually won a Spur Award. It's a, um, called A Thousand Texas Longhorns. Uh, it's a chapter in which absolutely nothing happens. <laughs> and of all the novels I've written and of all the chapters I've written, I, I have to think that. Um, this is my favorite that I ever ever penned. So I pick, I'll pick up here just a few paragraphs into the chapter. It's about two Illinois, uh, Indiana Civil War veterans on a cold winter day at the town's cafeteria. How long you been here? Catlin asked. Just got here. Got a cup of coffee, died, got a cup of water, died with coffee. You were so focused on your chow, you didn't even hear me say, afternoon, Captain. Oh. Catlin eyed his food. Grover studied the newspaper. Two dollars a year, Grover said. A man would think there'd be something worth reading. You subscribe to an Indianapolis newspaper? No, he turned the page. Found it on a bench outside of Marston's. You getting a photograph or Ambro type taken? Neither. Grover, Grover flipped to another page. Just walking past. He's closed on Sundays anyhow. He peered over the top of the paper. You ever get a likeness made of yourself? Catlin nodded. Indianapolis, before we marched south. Tin tap. Mailed one. No, must have been two to Mon Pond, Michigan. I got four. Must have kept one for myself. Don't know what I did with the other. How much did that cost? He shrugged. Two bits, four, dollar. Don't rattle your call. Grover returned to the newspaper, went to another page, looked at Catlin again. How'd you know it was an Indianapolis newspaper? I left it on the bench outside of Wallace's grocery's house. You subscribe to the Sentinel? No, I found it in the trash box outside of Culver's. You buying a book or crockery? Grover asked. Where? At Culver's? No, he's closed too, it being Sunday. I just looked down by chance, saw it, picked it up. Wonder how it got all the way up here. The paper, I mean. Drummer, I warn. Most likely. Wonder how I got from Culver's to Marston's. That's a mystery for sure. Catlin looked at his plate side. You don't read the Herald? Charlie Powell don't put nothing in his paper except advertisements for blood pills. You? Catlin was too late trying to cover his yawn. Excuse me. I'll pick up one now and then when I find one at the grocery or Culver store. How'd you win a wheat make out? Slim. Yours? About the same. Spring wheat was average. Mine too. 
Figure this spring will be better. Catlin nodded. If we get some decent rain, silence. Come to church. Got here too late. You? I just got here. A month or maybe just a minute passed. Well, I know why you left this on the bench. Nothing worth reading in Indianapolis either. There's always something worth reading, Catlin said. What? Sign, Catlin took the paper, turned to the second page and tapped the quotation below the paper's name and the date. The Union, it must be preserved, Jackson. Grover nodded, took the paper and slid it to the side of the table. Catlin plowed through the potatoes with a spork, preparation he figured for spring, if spring ever returned. Grover slurped, Catlin farmed the mashed potatoes, the gravy hardened, the waitress walked by without checking on either. You know what I like to read in any newspaper? Grover asked. What? Catlin said. Grover picked up the paper, turned, turned the page, tapped a column on the, and said, the railroad schedules, Bellefontaine Railway. Catlin feared his friend would start reading the whole damn ta table, trains arriving from the east, the west, the expresses, plus everything else, but no. Steve Grover condensed things considerably, and even Indianapolis liked the bevy of railroads. The Atlantic and Great Western Railway, you planning on taking a trip? Where would I go? Callan shrugged. Lake Michigan? Wouldn't need to pay money for a train ticket to see that. Could march there if I had a mind to. I sure know how to march. Callan smiled with understanding. You ever see Lake, Lake Michigan? Callan looked up, surprised at the question and his answer. Can't rightly say I have you. Grover's head shook. Another round of silence. Funny, Grover said. What's that? Lake Michigan. Grover sipped his coffee. Two of us, we saw so much of the South, even Washington City, and we haven't seen a big lake that's, what, 20 miles north of us, if that? Catlin grinned. You want to go? Where? Lake Michigan. Grover shook his head. Not in the winter. Maybe come spring. The head shook again. We'll be plowing. Another taste of wheat coffee. Besides, it's just a bunch of water. Catlin thought about tasting the meal he paid for, decided against it. Ran into Mrs. Yoho at Oliver's store yesterday, Grover said. How's she doing? Got the Qatar. I see. Getting better. There are remedies. Grover tapped the newspaper. Papers full of advertisements for cures, especially in Charlie's Herald. Last time I saw a copy, anyhow. Must be an epidemic. You ever caught it? Don't think so. But I don't rightly know what the Qatar is. Me neither. Two months passed. Or maybe it was just a couple of minutes. It's just a cold, Grover said, something like that. What's that? The Qatar. Yeah, congestion. Runs down the back of your throat. Huh? Qatar. Yeah, I know what it is. Most people do. Old Banish seemed to have it from Louisville to Atlanta. Likely still has it. Where'd he hail from? Grover thought. Union Mills? I thought it was Unionville. Might have been. Union something. Maybe Rensselaer. They grinned, sipped coffee, which still wasn't good. Catlin wondered how his dinner would taste if he'd bothered to eat. Then again, he knew how it tasted. Hell, that's what everyone ate here whenever they came to town to splurge on a meal, something they didn't have to cook for themselves. And when they ate at home, this was the same blessed meal they'd cook. She asked if I'd speak to the union, unconditional union girls of Laporte, Grover said. Who? Mrs. Yoho? Catlin had to figure out where Mrs. Yoho came into the conversation. Speak about what? He asked after a moment. Grover smiled and tapped the folded newspaper. How I preserve the union. Oh, Catlin wondered if the beef might be halfway decent. I got asked to speak once. To the unconditional union girls? Catlin shook his head. St. Rose's Academy. What'd you say? Nothing. I told the headmistress to ask me another time after the wheat crop was in. Oh, you get asked to talk a lot? Catlin looked at his friend. I don't get to town often. Yeah? What brought you into town today? Run some errands. Not much open on a Sunday. I know. Is anything open on the port on a Sunday? Catlin shrugged. The dining palace? Church? Livery? What I figured. What errands, errands did you run? I run away from the farm. Grover smiled. Yeah, me too. The bell above the door jingled. Cold air came in. Hot air went out. See you, hon, the waitress told the fellow with the silk hat. The door closed. The waitress went back to reading the penny dreadful. What'd you tell her? Callan asked after another season came and went. Who? Mrs. Yoho. Oh, he slurped more coffee. Callan waited. 
Well, what? What did you tell Mrs. Yoho? Nothing. He wiped his nose. Oh, I guess you told her to ask me next time when I had more time. It's December, Steve. You won't have less time than right now. Well, they drank. Catlin gave up on his dinner and slid the plate over to Grover. You hungry? Catlin asked. You aren't going to eat this? Catlin shook his head. Off your feet? Just not hungry. My pa wouldn't let me get up from the supper table till I'd clean my plate. He raised his head, suspicious. You want me to pay for no, Steve? Eat. It's cold, but it's on me. Well, I can't say I'm hungry, but the plate was empty three minutes later. Steve Grover wiped his mouth with the sleeve of his coat. They sure know how to make good roast beef and mashed potatoes here, that's for sure. It's their specialty. Maybe it's the Qatar, Grover said. Catlin looked up, his, blank, his face blank. What's ailing you? Grover explained. Nothing ailing me, Steve, except what? Catlin smiled. Boredom. Grover's face surprised Catlin, his old friend, friend for something like felt like 20 years now when it just be four come spring, knew what he meant. When half the time John Catlin couldn't figure that out himself. Remember what you said? Grover asked. When? In Washington City during the Grand Review. Before Catlin's head shook, Grover answered his own question. You said, Steve, we're going home at last. Remember, that's exactly what you said. He drained the coffee with the final two slurps, set the empty mug beside the plate. Here we are, walking past President Lincoln, Sherman, Grant, Sheridan, ladies throwing flowers at us, swooning, men cheering, and after all we've been through, you just wanted to get home. Catlin smiled. All I wanted to do was get home after we first saw the elephant. Me too, Grover said. Best time of my life, but I was too scared to know it. Me too. Horse apples. Catlin looked up. You were born a soldier, John. Captain Saban said you took to infantry faster than crap flowed through a goose. Made first fifth sergeant before I could shoulder a musket. Captain after Atlanta. Mrs. Yoho ought to ask you to speak about. The words trailed off. Catlin remembered. 25 years old when he had joined the fight in August of 62, all that marching and drilling in the Indiana summer, meeting Steve Grover, meeting hundreds of other men. Lake Michigan. Huh? I was just thinking. I've never seen anything before we enlisted. Well, Ohio. Maybe I ought to get to see, go see Lake Michigan. You seen Ohio, John? I was born in Ohio. Can't say I remember much about it. Pa and Ma had the wanderlust. They're living in Michigan now. Never seen Michigan either. We sure saw a lot of country. I don't think you'd want to see Lake Michigan now, John. It's colder than a witch's teed outside. Spring, summer, and fall came and went. And here they sat 10 minutes later at the dining palace in Laporte. Most likely the waitress, the waitress had started her fifth half dime novel. The cook was probably on his third marriage. The owner might have sold his interest in taking the Bellefontaine to anywhere. What would you tell them? Grover asked. Tell who? The Union Girls, our St. Rose's Academy. Were they to ask you again? Oh, Catlin shrugged. He finished his coffee. Coffee was better in the 87th, he said. Grub was too. That's what you tell them? Who? Mrs. Yoho, you darn fool. Charlie Powell at the Laporte Herald, the head mistress at the St. Rose's, the governor, President Johnson, were he to give you a medal, your ma, your pa, anybody who asked. Oh, no, I don't talk about it much. When I get to ask, I just shrug, say we won the war, save the Union, free the slaves. If I say even that, I'm the same. The clock ticked. The waitress stared at them long and hard before she turned another page and some. Pretty dreadful. Well, Captain Stretch, guess it's about that time. Yeah. Getting late. Yeah. Ought to get my wagon, head back home. Yeah, might come a good snow, maybe. Moisture would help. They waited. We did it though, didn't we, Grover said. What's that? Grover punched the newspaper. The Union, it must be preserved. We sure preserved her. Catlin nodded. He made himself stand, otherwise they might be here till the century turned. The waitress looked their way, relief washing over her face. Catlin found his watch in his vest pocket, checked the time side. You know what I tell him? A sadness filled Steve Grover's eyes. Tell who? The unconditional Union girls. Oh, Catlin said. What? I tell those ladies this. 
I never knew how gall darn boring Indiana was till I went off to war. So when the editor or the um, copy editor sent me the proofs back, what she said at the end of that chapter was, there's only one thing wrong with this chapter. It ended. And I thought that was very sweet and very kind and, and I loved it. And it certainly made up for all the comments she made about the other 70 chapters. So this is about dialogue. Why don't we have a, a little conversation and talk about how we do and what we don't do in dialogue.